at the very end, I needed I needed gumballs. So I'm gonna give. I'm one of the really most talented miniaturists of our time, and I'm just. It, it starts off with observation, um, and, and just look beyond. Welcome, welcome. Hello and good afternoon, folks. How is everybody doing? Chat box is open, as always, because I like to hear from you guys. Welcome to this Meet the Miniaturist Sunday afternoon, morning, evening. I don't know where you guys are joining from, but I like to hear from you. So go ahead and um, send a shout out in the chat box. Bonjour from Montreal. Very nice. Hi, Arlene. How are you? Great to see you. If you folks are just joining, um, give us a shout out, say hello. Um, uh, yeah, hi there, hi Janice, good to see you. Um, hello Tennessee, hi Kate, good to see you too. So yeah, um, so I'm gonna wait just an, a few more seconds before I um, send a welcome out definitely say hello in the chat box, folks. Welcome to this Meet the Miniature Sunday afternoon. So excited to see everybody. Hi, Donna from West Gray, Canada. I love my Canadians. Hi, Mindy. Winnipeg, more Canadians. Got a lot of Canadians on the line today. Great to see everybody. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and say hello and um, welcome folks into this Meet the Miniaturist live stream. Good to see everybody. If you don't know me, if you just, if you, this is your first Meet the Miniaturist, I'd love to, to know that. So say that, um, uh, let me know that in the chat box. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I am Darren Scala. I am, uh, I have D. Thomas Miniatures, and my main goal is really to raise awareness of miniatures as a fine art form. And I do that through lectures and talks and live streams like this, but I'm also a maker, I am a hobbyist, but I also sell miniatures. Uh, so I do estate sales and I um, sell miniatures of collectors from collections. Uh, and I haven't actually have an eBay sale happening starting tonight. We're gonna put the link in the, in the uh, chat box. Donald is with us. Say hello to Donald, who's always wonderful helping behind the scenes. We're gonna put a link to my eBay selling site so you guys can go check out the latest offerings uh, uh, from an estate sale and estate finds that I have discovered. Um, this estate sale is kind of fun. It's kind of a really nice mix. It's a healthy mix of both artisan and commercial pieces. So a lot of pieces are affordable, I would think, because they're not necessarily so heavy intensive on artisan. Uh, but check that out starting tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And it, the auction on eBay will end next Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so check it out. A uh, couple of other events. I had a recent, last weekend's uh Meet the Miniaturist is now on my YouTube channel. It is, uh, the replay is available. That was with uh, uh, Nick from Abandoned Miniatures. Check that out. The replay is posted on my YouTube channel. We're gonna post that link there too. Um, Janice is saying hi to Donald. <laughs> That's always good. Um, I don't have an immediate Meet the Miniaturist coming up right now, uh, but I am going to be heading to the Hudson River Museum and I'm going to be decorating the Nibblewick Hall, which is their fantastical 26 room mini mansion that's on permanent display. I'll be decorating that and I'll probably be posting something about it. So look for that as terms of, a, of an event. And then early in December, I'm going to be doing a live stream from the Knoxville Art Museum which houses several thorn rooms. And we're gonna be hosted there by um, a wonderful miniaturist. Uh, and um, her name is Jolie Gaston, uh, Jolie Gaston. And she's gonna be taking us around the thorn rooms at the Knoxville Museum. That's gonna be awesome. So look for that. Um, a couple of just events, if you should put them on your, put it on your radar. Uh, there were a couple of shows that happened. The Good Sam show happened. Uh, the Guild show just happened. The Dallas Miniature Showcase is coming up this weekend. And then the Philadelphia Miniaturia is happening the first week in November. And then the London Dollhouse Festival is in December. So lots of shows, kind of like the show season is happening. So look for that um, in terms of other things that are happening. And if you um, never want to miss an update, go to my website, sign up and join my, um, you know, my email tree. I don't bombard you with email. So check that out. Go on my eBay, uh, my email um, and sign up for my updates if you're not already signed up. So with that, I would like to introduce our Meet the Miniatures guest, Al Chalaski. 
um, who is, I really think, I, I mean, I discovered him on, on, on um, Instagram, but I really think he is um, a miniaturist of our time, one of the really most talented miniaturists of our time. And I'm just so excited to be chatting with you today. Hi, Ab, good to see you. Um, and, you know, you, you, you call yourself a sculpture artist or sculpture artist. I call you an urban expressionist because you really take, you know, very famous buildings and restaurants and um, landmarks and you recreate them in tiny, excruciating detail. And what's amazing about them is not only the amazing structures that you create, but it's the stories behind them that really makes your work so incredible. So I'm thrilled to be chatting with you today. You have a um, you have a uh, one man show coming up. We're going to talk about that um, at the um, at the Small Arts on Sanibel Island. You're in Florida Big right art. now. Big Arts, sorry, Big, Big Arts on Sanibel Island. So with that, welcome and thank you for joining today. Um, and so let's just go right to the beginning. I know you have this extensive arts background. You started at RISD, you spent time in New York. You have this background in, in fashion and graphic and, and set design. Let's talk a little bit about that and how okay. that sort of um, really created the groundwork and the inspiration for a lot of the work that you do today. So let's talk about that background in art and background and your work background, and then let's dive into the actual miniatures. <laughs> All right. Uh, so where do you want me to start? Like, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background. I mean, you know, and, and about the background in 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 art and your background in set design and graphics. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I started pretty much. Uh, I grew up in the, in the fashion industry. My my father uh, had a had a had a manufacturing place. I I, I learned uh, at a young age how much I hated that industry, uh -huh. and how much I didn't want to be part of it. So uh, so, but I but I was always an artist. So I I always was drawing. I always was uh, doing something. So I, I knew I knew I was going to become an artist. Um, huh? uh, it was either that or a baseball player. And at, at my size, it was definitely an artist. It was at a certain uh -huh. point in my life. Um, so um, always it was a dream to go to RISD. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, you know, leaving Miami Beach to go up to Rhode Island, that, that had to be a good reason, right? Um, and 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 to be part of the art community and, and be part of a school like that was was just the, the right opportunity. Um, went you know went through my four years there. Uh, was mostly uh, a three D artist. I always yeah. loved. I always loved three D. Um, not and, necessarily. And, yeah, that? talk a little bit about that. What is three D art? What does that mean? Uh, so I I always saw my art as not just on paper or canvas. I always saw it as as a uh, as a 360 as a, you see it from all different angles and i i i love to build stuff I, I was a tinkerer um people have asked me it was like you know what was what was my first uh inspiration who are like my first uh people inspired and i i always say it's like when i when i came to this country um and i saw color tv for like the first time and the first thing one of the first things i saw was mr rogers neighborhood and that opening sequence of taking it through that miniature town and going through that and it was just like eye-opening it was just like yeah. wow it's like what an amazing an amazing uh thing that is and and it's just like love at first sight. i just got hooked um, yeah. so i always saw everything as as 3d art uh, yeah. Even when I did my fine arts and painting, I always did something 3D element to it. Um, and then, but I was always interested in, in theater too. I always did the school plays and things like that. And um, just started yeah. creating this, 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 these worlds. Uh, Red Grooms was also a, a big influence of mine. Uh, seeing his show, like in the mid seventies, the, the Ruckus Manhattan was mind blowing. So it, it, it's, it's just something that's just how I wanted to express myself. Yeah. And, and so you, and, you, you, you ended up in set design working in, in, yeah. in the theater, in, uh, yeah. in the Broadway um, world for, for right. a period of time. Talk a little bit about that. What was that like? What was, what was your, your, what was that? The, the, the output? I mean, would you start with sketches and build models all the way through to the actual show? Yeah. I, I the, the models were a lot more important than anything else uh, oh, really? the drawings and the sketches and and the drafting and all that that was you know you worked in collaboration with the uh with the with, with the uh, studios that were building it you know they had their experts and you know things had to be you know certain weight limits and things like that but um 
the models became the creative beginnings of a show. And yeah. um, a lot of the directors, like Hal Prince that I worked for, uh, like to use the models to block their shows. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, they would take like little figures and models and literally these guys, you know, here's this man who's won 25 Tony Awards playing yeah what looked like a dollhouse and saying this is where uh you know in showboat this is where this guy's gonna go and he starts going up the stairs and it's like yeah but he but he visualizes the show and it really gets put together at that point uh i i, I think uh i i you know i like to say that the, the sets are the most important things of a show i'm you know the lighting people think their stuff is more important yeah you know music composure things but but for me i think you know, the director used our 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 work as a as the groundbreaking tool to 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 create these musicals and how he's going to stage them and how he's going to have things come in and excite the audience yeah uh, and that was a great experience that was really i mean i worked for I assisted uh, this uh, guy, Eugene Lee, who is probably the greatest set designer in my book of all time. Yeah. He won like six Tony Awards and everything. And and uh, and he, he was great just to watch and observe and see what he did and and and, and just be part of his world for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it, it was great. I got to experience a lot of great stuff at a, at a young age. Yeah. So all this time that you're working in these different, you know, these different worlds, you're creating your own art. You're doing your own work. Um, right. Talk a little bit about that, um, specifically around this, this, the, the latter part of your time, when you started to do these sort of these, you know, in-depth structures, um, right. these urban structures, and talk a little bit about the inspiration behind what started you wanting to do these pieces in 3D, because they are really 3D works. Right, um, right. Um, like I, like I mentioned, uh, Red Grooms was probably my, my favorite artist, uh, mm-hmm. uh, like in, in my, in my, I would say in my college years. And I, I, I really loved what he did. I got to meet him. Um, I lived in a, in a building. My first apartment was on 29th street and we lived in a, and I lived in a loft above Rudy Burkhart, who was Red Grooms, one of his best friends. And I got to meet Red through him. And, uh, I was just like, this is my idol. I'm meeting you. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, so it, 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 it's kind of like, it, it's a, it's my first works were more, whim, were, were, were more whimsical and yeah. a little more theatrical and they were a little bit more like Red Groom's work rather than now my, my latter work is more, um, almost exact miniature replicas and yeah. the, uh, I used to use the characters uh, out of clay and I used to build them out of clay and I used to use the characters um, I like that I would create as the story and then the buildings were where the story takes place and yeah. you can see the story through the characters whether it's fashion or whatever uh, but now it's like the buildings um, the structures are the story because yeah. um, part of a group. There's a, 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 the, the show I'm having is 13 pieces called Lost but Not Forgotten, yes. and there are all these places that they have three things in common. One, uh, they are either famous buildings or famous architectural styles that's important. Uh, the second thing is I have to have a personal story. Mm-hmm. in each of these places that takes place, whether it's something stupid that happened to me in these places or something great that happened to me in these places. But I have a personal story and a personal, like, I, I could sit down at a bar with somebody and be like, hey, this happened to me here. And, right. you know, something really stupid I'm embarrassed about. And then we all laugh and, and, and right. go on. And the third thing in common is all these places are no longer around. They're gone. Uh-huh. You know, CBD's is a John Barbados store. Mars Bar is a TD Waterhouse. You know, it's a uh, they're 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 they. I'm I'm, cap- I'm sort of I'm sort of like uh, each piece now. The story behind them is it's part a historical database of mm-hmm. what of the time period of the late '80s and early '90s, mixed in with an autobiographical story of myself during that time. Right. So I'm actually sharing now some of your work with showing the, the New York City subway um, back. I would imagine this is what the 80s that we're showing. I mean, with all of this graffiti on the cars and things like that. Well, no, the, 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 uh, the thing about that piece is uh, so when I went back to New York in the early 90s, mm-hmm. um, 
I had a I had a fascination with these subway cars because when I grew up in New York, when I was uh, like three, four years old and I uh, lived in Queens and we lived in the tenements of Queens uh-huh. and uh, I could see out my fifth story window and it was all like um, these brown brick high rises all around me. And uh, but I could see a couple blocks away Junction Boulevard and every couple of minutes see one of these beautiful like these this colorful train go by. Uh-huh amazed by that by that vision and i would always draw them or build them as a little kid and and create and i got fixated with the graffiti part of it and it was just like this like colorful splash that came through my life every few minutes looking out the window uh so then when i get back to new york in the 90s um they were mostly gone um and then but i heard these rumors that uh the city of new york was storing them in abandoned subway stations and then they would take them every once in a while when they had an opportunity and and dump them in, in water to create artificial reefs. Right. So I'm like, okay, I got to get myself, I got to see these things. And I, I got a couple of buddies from, from NYU and uh, we uh, borrowed some, uh-huh. uh, some theater, <laughs> some like, you know, heavy duty movie lights out of the uh, closet. And uh, we found an entrance to the Chamber Street, the old, the abandoned Chamber Street station. Right. Uh, it was closed so we went down there and completely terrifying it was a it was a post-apocalyptic <laughs> zombie set <laughs> i mean it was, it was just and we were flashing the lights around and there were like animals running everywhere and uh and uh i, I saw a bunch of these cars down there uh just stored on the tracks so wow. i i took a bunch of pictures and uh this is a depiction um it's not the it's not the exact graffiti that was on that train i used some yeah. I, I used a little bit of artist liberty on the graffiti i wanted to do to have some kind of color splash but like yeah. these tra- these trains were down there and they were all painted up in these uh these abandoned stations down there and then i wow. hear that there was like 30 or 40 abandoned stations just like this all scattered all over the manhattan that oh. are no longer used. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, all right. So this is one of the pieces that are in the show. Uh, yes. This, all these, uh, all these are coming up. Are all in the show. Yeah. Wow. That's just crazy. Um, so there's, there are other, I'm, I'm going to bring up another video because I want to share, um, you know, just, just some of the structures. The other ones were, you know, and actually we're going to see this in person, <laughs> right? <laughs> you have it with you. Um, <laughs> But these are more structural as opposed to the trains, which are, I don't know. I don't know how you would d- divide the two. Um, there's a lot of noise. <laughs> I think it's actually your noise. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about this piece. So this is a New York City newspaper yes. stand? Yeah. Yes, this is actually the newspaper, the newsstand that, that was in the island on uh, 72nd and Broadway. Uh, it was an island entrance to the uh, uh, to the uh, subway station, and this uh, new stand was up there. And uh, my last apartment in New York, my last place there, I lived there at a, a little brownstone on 71st Street. And uh, this was always my stop every morning. I would I would I would get, uh, head over um, even when I had my daughters, but there were one and three at the time. I would put them on <laughs> little baby Bjorns and go over there, grab my New York Post. Uh, and then head over to Columbus and 70th to my favorite uh, breakfast place, the Muffins Cafe, which I, we call uh-huh. the little uh, little bakery or or the muffin ca- or, we called the muffin shop actually, and yeah. uh, and it was this great place. And I mean, it was my daily ritual, and it all started with you know I'd go there, get my post, and uh, go to this place and have my my latte and, uh, yeah. and, and 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 read my paper every morning. Yeah. And so then there's it. Pearl Paint, of course. I'm, I mean, as an artist, I would imagine, I mean, this is this was the place to go to get your art supplies. I would imagine. How does this Absolutely. how does this touch your life? Uh, so, yes. Uh, when I'm, uh, so I lived uh, I lived just on the uh, north side of Soho, right by the Angelica Theater. I had a, I had an apartment there. And uh-huh. uh, so I'd always go to Pearl Paint. I had the gallery. I had my gallery on Green Street. So I'd always every day walk to Pearl Paint when I needed to. Um, it was just my everyday. I probably spent as much time there than any place else, probably second to my apartment. And, wow. and my favorite story is about that. I only did the first three floors. It's actually a five story structure. Uh, yeah. That th- th- if anybody's familiar with Pearl Paint in the uh, 90s on, yeah. on a hot summer day uh, with no central air and they had air conditioning units, one per floor that did nothing. Um, and they had this one little tiny elevator in the back. and 
you know, everybody would use it. So sometimes you could be waiting 20, 30 minutes just to see if the elevator, if you could get yeah. on it and there's so you could it. So it was walking up the stairs and those stairs, I'm telling you, were, if anybody went there in, in the nineties, they will agree. Those were the most brutal stairs in the history of the world. And yeah, but that building we, also should have been condemned at that time. And that was then it was a dangerous building to be walking up those steps. Cause I remember oh, it. Oh yeah, completely. <laughs> and, and, and now they're like, you know, million dollar loss. Yeah. They convert, right. So, so wow. it's gone. You know, Pearl, Pearl yeah. Paint was an institution, and yeah. I got to experience Pearl Paint both in Florida and here because the original one, actually, the first one was on uh, Fort, Fort Lauderdale, which I went to when I lived in Miami. Oh, really? So I, I didn't to, know that. That's yeah, awesome. I went to Oakland Park Boulevard. Yeah, um, I, I went to both of those places all the time. But I, I just loved Pearl Paint. Pearl Paint was like, the, you know, yeah. it's, it was my toy store. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, there. I don't think there's anything like it today. Any, you know, there's no. nothing that has everything all in one place and sort of the vibe. There was a vibe to that place, you know, very New York City art vibe, you know, really yeah. cool people were shopping for paint in that store back then and supplies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You just don't yeah. get that anymore. You just don't, you just don't. Yeah. So, so, what's that? You just, you just, you just mentioned the gist of my show. It's like, these are things you don't get anymore. You don't, you don't get your newspapers and a newsstand and go sit in a cafe. You don't, you don't yeah. go, you know, you don't go to these places like you're showing Optimo cigars right now. And, and yeah. there's a time New York city was littered with those blue Greek coffee cups, because this is before Starbucks was in every corner and you would get your coffee in places like this and you would get your everything. You get your beer, your coffee, your drinks, your newspapers, your candy, your smokes in, in, right. in these places. And they, they just don't do that anymore. Yeah. So talk a little bit about why it, it's so important that you you capture these moments and capture these pieces from your life. I mean, is it is it part of it for you? Is it cathartic for you? But it's also to educate folks like a little bit of talk a little bit about what that means to you. Um, I am. I, I love collecting memories. I love mm -hmm. keeping as you can see by my office background, I, I, I pretty much have everything from the 1970s, every toy ever made that I, that it's, I, I like remembering uh, parts of my life through, through actual physical objects and seeing them and, and reliving those memories. And, yeah. and, I, and all these, all these places, all these structures that I did for my show, Lost But Not Forgotten, were all from my photographs that I would take. I have a couple of box loads, maybe about 20, 30,000 photographs. And this is before iPhones and, you know, used to have it, had, had all the uh, Canon A1 and used to have it all get developed at the, uh, at the corner store. And, right. That's you know, right. And I just, have, right. I just have stacks and stacks and stacks of these photos. And uh, so it's, it's a way to, again, it, it was an interest for me to capture the life of these places and yeah. what they meant not only to me, but what they mean to other people too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, I feel like I have my stories in these places. And I think I've meeting all these people online, they all tell me their stories about these places. And it's just so fascinating yeah. for me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you're definitely capturing a moment in time um, that needs to, and, and, and stories that need to be told to people who don't understand what New York yeah. city was like back then, or, or you know, um, what, what these pe what these buildings meant to people like you as an artist. So I think it's, it's, um, it's awesome. It's awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your process. Um, okay. I know there are probably, um, tons of questions that people might have about, you know, your process of how you make miniatures and how you come up with your ideas. And I'm, I have a, a, a piece, um, I, 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 I swipe some, uh, some video from your Instagram account, which we're going to put, we put your Instagram account on there. Um, so folks can go and follow you because you have some really awesome images on your Instagram account. But let's talk a little bit about your process. And we understand now where these ideas come from. But once you figure out what it is you want to do, what is the first step? What is, what do you, like, how do you put pen to paper? What do you do? So, um, again, the, the, the story is the first part of the process. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's like I had a bunch of, of these places that I wanted to, to, to show that had uh, my story to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most, I think that's the most important thing. The second part of the process is also I needed, got, had to do my research because I needed to be uh, spot on realistic. Mm -hmm. 
with, with, with these. I, 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 I almost looked upon these like, like they were period piece movies or period piece theatrical sets. Um, I learned a very important lesson from Eugene uh, designing sets early in the life when he's like, you, you, you gotta be, if you're doing a period piece, you gotta be spot on because there's always going to be that one person who's going to find that mistake and then it's <laughs> not good. So, uh, so I would do that and I'll go over when I show you the new stand a little bit and how, yeah. can't wait. what I do to make it a time period, it has to be perfect to that time period. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of research involved in getting the, you know, this is 1992. I had to have the right, garbage from 1992 and the right posters up on the wall and the right bills and everything it had to be it had to be like the u2 concert from yankee stadium yeah. in 92 up there not u2 from 98 it right would be wrong so i had was, to find those i had to find those images and recreate them uh through my library so yeah. that's number two is getting the right research done and then to actually build the structures i uh, i'm very old school i don't use um uh, any kind of uh 3d printers or anything like that I, I i actually start building these like i built a theater set where i i i create uh just flats with wood and and cardboard and i create you know and then i build off of the flat just like uh -huh. you do in a, like an old school theater set um so so, so you know, wait when you say you work off a of flat so if this image that we see here that is that what you would consider a flat you would start oh, with a flat it, and then build it would, it would be the main structure would be a flat piece and then i would i would brace them in the back with wood and then i would build uh i would build outwardly and then inwardly also i would create both inwardly and outwardly create the full 3d effect but again i i i i treat these like they are like like they're a theater set like and a and and I build them out of out of wood and and chipboard to start with those are my main two materials to start with and mm -hmm. then then everything else after that is uh, it's gonzo. After that, it's like like literally, I spend I spend as much time at a Lowe's or Home Depot or hardware store than I do at an art store, because I'm I'm buying sh I'm getting shapes I'm I'm buying things that I could take apart and yeah. it's like use this little plumbing piece to create a fan and use this oh. little thing here to do that and use and. And literally, I, I could tinker with things and put things together and take things apart that are going to give me the right shapes I need. Uh, you know, like, for instance, one of my and I'm going to show you this one. There's yeah. an example of doing that. Interesting. Uh, oh, wow. So, that is just crazy. So oh, the, my, my goodness. So one of my favorite things on that one is the uh, is the gumball machine. So the gumball machine is just like uh, like the glass or like the perfume bottles uh, we need more time with that piece can you put it back in front okay. and, and and talk about the gumbo machine <laughs> no you, you you we need more time <laughs> oh my see the gumbo machines it's literally yes. uh it's perfume bottles uh really? the red part is a cap to my glue um the top part is a um a button um <sighs> Then, then, then the rest is wood and plastic and little things that I then I'll create out of paper. And at the very end, I needed I needed gumballs that are going to give me a nice half inch scale gumball, and I found them in sprinkles. Oh, in my wow. wife, in my wife's cabinet. So I treated them so they don't rot away, and it, and it yeah. literally is. So they they really do. You could shake them up, <laughs> and if they move. It's just and they're just sprinkles. And uh, yeah. And I age them and I, and I texture everything. And yeah, well, and, I want to talk about your weathering and your aging and it, 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 but I want to just talk a little bit. It doesn't look like it's very heavy or maybe you're just moving it around. No, it's not heavy at all. Maybe it's about 10 pounds at the most. Right. It looks pretty light. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and everything is pretty locked down. I mean, you moving that thing around, you are certain. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's like that. Yeah. What's <laughs> that? Yeah, I, I, yes, pretty, I, I've glued my hands together a few times. <laughs> so, wow. pretty light. so, so I mean, that is a pretty intricate piece, and there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual pieces that make that up. Yeah. How long does it make you to take you to make a piece like that? Can you quantify the hours? No, I can't. <laughs> and not even um, counting the time you spent at Lowe's. I'm looking right, for the, right. looking for the gumball. 
I, I don't quantify the hours because um, I, I, that's that's the number one question I always get. How long did it take you? Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know. I don't. I don't keep track of the time. And since I do other stuff also, like you know, I do you know my fashion work and my art director yeah. work during yeah. the daytime. And then you know sometimes when I don't have any of that work going, I'll spend 10, 12 hours, fourteen hours a day on this thing. Sometimes I can only spend one or two. So yeah. um, I, I don't jot down the hours and uh, and anything like that. Um, right. I just I just used all my time up. Whether it's my day job uh or my my uh side hustle which is what this right. is <laughs> right right well let's see if anybody has any questions um from the chat box before i get to um talking about the show because really the show is is um i mean i wish i can get down to florida and i might be down to florida between now and what is it so the show is happening uh it's opening next week it opens up the 22nd uh oh. artist reception is the 5th of november and the show runs through the 12th of December. 12th of December. I wish it was going at least through Christmas. I'm definitely, I'm planning to be down at some point. I would love to hop over on that coast because I'll be down probably in South Florida in the, in the, you know, Fort Lauderdale area. Does anybody have any questions before we, because before I ask some questions about the show, I don't see anybody asking a question. Okay. Let's talk about this. So how, this is your first one man show. Um, how many pieces are in this show? And, um, and, and talk a little bit about the, the media piece that, that was created for it. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's my first one man show here in Florida and, and it's my first one in a, in a long time. Um, I used to have a lot of those in New York. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, so I have 13 pieces that are going to be up. Um, and each of them, like I said, it, it, it's a little historic tour of, uh, of, of, of both Miami and New York and, and, juxtaposed with with my life and my autobiography of what happened in these places and a little, yeah. and uh, each of them has these plaques uh mm -hmm. next to them and you read the whole story um so hopefully you get more than just a a visual uh when you go through the show you could go and read each plaque and then it'll tell you a story of the structure what made it significant what made it important yeah. uh, and then it'll also tell you my my little story about something that happened to me in these places I love uh, it. A little background of myself, and I think by the time you go through all thirteen of them, you get a really good sense of who I was uh, in my early twenties back in you know nineteen uh, nineties New York. Yeah, uh, yeah, wow. And yeah. Um, and and, uh, and there's a pr in process piece that's part of this too that that we can see. Um, well, uh, the building of one of the pieces, right? It's going to be. Yeah. So yeah, so I, I'm almost. I'm going to have a, a, a video screen up. Uh, it's the Optimus cigar one, and uh, I shot it in in um, in, in fast uh, in fast motion. I don't even know what that's called. Um, uh, so I shot that in about forty, yeah, forty eight segments, and I uh, had a buddy of mine put it all together with some music, and start to finish of that piece, and we got it. Got, got it down to about seven and a half minutes long, play some music with it, and you get to watch right. you get to watch the building being built. Uh, I get to move my hands past and seeing the whole thing go up uh, from start yeah. to finish. I and wonder if we'll everything. be able to see that if we don't get to see the show in person, if, if, if that will be posted somewhere after the show? I, I, I think I'll, I'll probably post it on my website. I, okay. I, 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 don't, I don't think I'll post it on Instagram because it's just like, you know, not too many people will spend seven minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, watching something um I, I might i might cut it down maybe do a like a 30 second version of it and make it really fast yeah uh, but I, I don't know if you'll see everything there but uh the seven minute one is really nice and uh i'll, I'll probably put that up on my website yeah um let, let's take a step back a little because so a lot uh, several questions are about your and we didn't touch upon this about your your weathering process and techniques can you talk a little bit about how you get that level of realism um how you work this through? Um, I, I guess the, the number one thing there is observation. Um, mm -hmm. it, it starts off with observation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and just look beyond the obvious and see the things, especially, you know, like during, during the garbage and during the, the you know, and, and knowing the subject matter that you're doing, it's like, uh, you know, 
making sure that there is cigarette doing the cigarette butts and, and doing that kind of stuff. And, and New York, New York streets are like really funny in a way, because it's just like, we used to call it like the New York measles. And over the years, you know, you walk around sidewalks here in Florida and they're pretty clean in New York. They all look like they have everything around New York looks like it has like these black dots everywhere. Yeah. And it's years and years of people dropping gum and being stepped on. And it just like, so you have to observe that you have to be yes. part of that. And that's got to be part of the piece too. I have yeah. to take pen and, and splatter paint to make it look like that. Um, so, wow. so it's just observing these things, observing uh, the way, the way rust builds up on, on, on certain things, the way uh, uh, certain wood cracks and bends and distorts differently than metal and glass will. And uh, once you do the observation, then it's just like you figure out how to make them. Um, right. A lot of, but it's, different techniques, you know, a lot of dry brushing, a lot of, uh, staining. Um, I don't, I don't, it's, it's funny. I haven't airbrushed any of the graffiti yet. I've done, I've done those by brush and by hand. Really? Um, but I, I think I'm going to start trying to airbrush a few to see how that comes out. So I'm yeah. always going to try something new, something, a different way of, of, of doing it. But at the end of the day, I, I, I see my subject matter. I, I, I observe it. I study it. And then I figure out how to make it. And, and if it doesn't look right, then I'll try making it a different way and, and, and yeah. make it look right. Try if, if, if I can't make the trash can out of, out of, out of this, maybe I can make it out of that. If I can't make it out of that, maybe I can make it out of something else. So I'm always trying to find objects that I can manipulate mm -hmm. and add to it or then recreate it from scratch at that point. Yeah. Do you have a favorite tool? Is there, you have a go-to tool or is it just, you know, trying different things? I love my Dremel. <laughs> oh, the Dremel. Oh, nice. I love my Dremel. Dremel. Yeah. All right. And all the different there's, attachments. And oh, I got all, I got three, I got three Dremels working, different attachments. Oh, wow. um, that's great. Um, that's good. It, 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 yeah, if, if, I, if I could say, and if any one of those tools are my favorite, it, that's my favorite tool. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Wow. All right. Well, I think this has been amazing. I'm, um, you know, it's been great chatting with you. I, I, I hope I'm going to get down to see this show. Um, and I hope everybody at home gets, you get to go and see this show. It is lost, but not forgotten. Um, it is small arts at Water. on South Sanibel Island. Did I get that right? Yeah, it's um, on Sanibel. Yeah. Big, big, yeah. big arts on Sanibel. Big arts on Sanibel. Um, yeah. And so what's, so what, is, I mean, you have this show coming up. I don't even ask the question what's next because you're right in the middle of it. Um, right. But, you know, are you continue, do you continue to, to, to think through what's next and, and what you'd like to like put, do? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so next it's, it's, um, I'm torn between one of two things. Ah. Uh, so next after this show, the next subject matter I might want to tackle is, my kind of my heritage and doing something about Cuba, oh, um, nice. Nice. which, which is going to be strange for me because it's going to be the first time I'm not going to use my own reference materials. I'm going to have to research a lot of it because I have no right. reference material. Right. Uh, so it's either going to be that, or I'm going to go completely the opposite and, you know, go back to doing some stuff. There's like a, a you know, there's, there's a series of, of, of pencil drawings that I've been wanting to do also very, very super realistic. So mm -hmm. my, I might do that. I'm not sure. I'm just, I'm, I'm just torn between the two things right now. All right. Um, awesome. But it's good but that we're, we're going to continue to see you and continue to see the yeah, great work you're doing. So thank you so much for spending this time with us on this Sunday. Good luck with your show. Um, thank you all you guys at home for joining this Meet the Miniaturist. Don't forget, I've got an eBay sale happening starting tonight in a couple of hours. Um, if you ever miss one of these, Meet the Miniaturist, we always um, post them on replay. Um, everybody have a great week. Thank you again for joining this Meet the Miniaturist. Have a great rest of your night. And um, I'll see you next time. All right, take care. Bye.